The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Okay. Our team All right, I do. are the first feet on the ground, first eyes on the resources. You don't move to Lake Fork for recreational. You're here for that fish of a lifetime. We use helicopters to ferry all the equipment we need to get up there and build the guzzlers high enough up to be utilized by the bighorn sheep. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. There is a delicate balance going on between the fragile ecosystems where we live and the fossil fuels which we need. Unfortunately, this relationship can be at times a tenuous one. When accidents happen, a special team of biologists answer the call. With failing infrastructure for pipelines and with an increased activity, the number of spills that we see are increasing. Because of all the drilling going on in Texas, they say that we are probably just as big as the Iraq field in Texas right now. We are only going to get busier. They are the Kills and Spills team, and these first responders are needed now more than ever. Talco, Texas. An oil pipe has burst, and now the oil and sludge is choking a nearby creek. Okay. Our team there you go. All right, I can do. are the first feet on the ground, first eyes on the resources. We will go out and look for dead birds, oiled wildlife, and we also identify where the cleanup needs to begin. Yeah, it looks like there's pretty good bit of oil upstream and downstream. Meet Greg Conley. It's uh, shell is open with fresh meat in there. He is one of four regional biologists that coordinate response to these fish and wildlife kills across the state. There's another small mussel. This is the first time I've seen this number of mussels, freshwater mussels, in a stream such as this in East Texas. There we go. It's surprising. But they're dead. It's not an easy process to uh, repopulate a mussel population. Yeah, all this movement in the water, those are all juvenile, small fish that were once in this creek. There's probably 20 small fish in here hanging on. Ugh. Seeing fish struggle like that, it's, it makes me feel disappointed that, that these um, uh, particular fish won't make it. So in this investigation, all the resources we find, specifically the fish. Just over three inches. Just over three inches, okay. We um, total up the species, the size, and get a value. And that value is, is uh, put towards a restitution project to restore the habitat was lost or somewhere nearby. The responsible party will cover the cost of cleanup. As for that restitution, the values can vary. This crawfish will cost 10 cents. Yep. A little over two inches. And this sunfish? Yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to identify that to species. 37 cents. The impacts that are caused for fish and wildlife kills due to oil and pollution events is often not very high. And so there isn't an incentive for them, other than being good stewards of our resources, they're not going to pay a lot of money. Texas is the country's top crude oil producer, and the business brings in billions. As part of this business, accidents happen, like this one near Texas City.
They need to get pictures first, right? Yep. Andy Turpak has word that several ducks are dead along this beach. In essence, we got oil on a beach where birds are coming through to, to rest, to feed as they continue their migration. So it's challenging right now. It looks like a scalp. It's pretty heavily oiled. I mean, you can see how there's hardly, can't even see feathers there. It's almost like it's been painted on like wax. They're looking for oiled birds, picking those birds up and getting them to a rehabilitation site to save those birds. Spills can wipe out many of the small fish and coastal invertebrates that live along the shoreline. If your food source goes away because of some sort of spill or, or pollution event, then you end up with animals that will die from starvation. So it's all interconnected. It's all about that you know, circle of life that we talk about. It's not just that we're going to try to save the birds. If we try to save the birds, that's, that's great, that's good. But we also need to be worried about impacts of the sand and the things that live in the sand the birds are feeding upon. There's a natural killer that this team also focuses on, a toxic algal bloom that hits the Gulf Coast called red tide. What the cell counts do when our crew looks at those, it's more for are we anticipating a fish kill pretty quickly. We know that once it hits five, once it hits 100, and we start looking at that, we're going to have to get staff onto the ground. While it can cause respiratory problems for humans, red tide is lethal for fish. When we have our first fish kill, they're out assessing what kind of fish are killed, how many they're killed, where it's occurring, and trying to assess what that impact is along the coast. If it's a natural event like a red tide, we can't do anything to stop that. In an oil spill, we may not be able to stop the oil, but we can protect some of the resources. Back at that oiled creek in Talco, Adam and Greg take a few more notes for their investigation. Definite water moccasin. These fish can disappear in that oil. You see the rainbow sheen is always indicative of a crude type spill, petroleum related. It's really impacting the creek uh, the deer are going to have to go somewhere else to drink. The coons are going to have to go somewhere else to drink. What a mess. That's exactly what goes through my head. What a mess. But I know they can make it better. The compensation for spills can be as little as $100, like here at Talco, or it can be upwards of a million dollars. When we're done with an event, any kind of event, and we get compensation from a responsible party, we actually are able to do good things for the resources. And an example of that could be with oyster reef restoration that we've done. Looks real healthy. As well as marsh and wetland creation and restoration. Inland, that can be fish stocking and habitat creation in lakes for fish, as well as stream creation and restoration. As for this creek, the members of the Kills and Spills team are doing everything they can to help it heal. This is sock boom. It's absorbent. It floats on the surface and it absorbs the oil as it passes by. If cleanup is done well, um, give it time, these systems typically are pretty resilient and can recover well. Makes me feel really good. I can actually come out here and what I feel is make an impact uh, for the better through what I do with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Kills and Spills team. You're here for that fish of a lifetime. You don't move to Lake Port uh, for recreational. Everybody dreams of catching a 10 pound black bass and this is one of the premier lakes for that. And it's a legendary lake. It's put you know, close to 50% of all the chair lunkers ever caught 
in the state of Texas. They currently have 35 of the top 50 bass. Lake Fork has all five of the top five. It produces legendary fish. It produces legendary fun. To preserve the legend of Lake Fork, that is our mission. <laughs> We're outdoor people. We are conservationists by heart. And then just the love for fishing that drew the organization together and it's stuck together. Every single member in that club has a love for this lake and a love for what we do for this lake. We need more organizations like the Lake Fork Sportsman Association. They're locally focused and they're angler led and there's a lot of beauties in it. First, they care. Second, they're on the water all the time. They understand what's going on with the fish, the fisheries, the lake, the aquatic habitats, and they've got a lot invested in the future. Oh, good fish. It's really beneficial to have a group who has the welfare of the lake at heart. They have the same type of interest that we do. It's rewarding to work towards a common goal. It makes you feel good to be able to serve a community and be able to help an organization that really helps at the Lake Fork fishery. Some of the projects we're known for, of course, is the live release boat and the support for that. The fingerling release, the start of this aquatic plant project with the Gaddis FFA. The relationship between the students and Lake Fork Sportsman Association is wonderful. They have come to know them by name. They're very patient and they're very nice. They want to help students learn and they enjoy teaching and they care about the lake so much that it makes us care about the lake as well. And then the high school tackle program, fishing teams. We gave away like 28 rods and reel combinations, hundreds and hundreds of various plastic lures and just everything they needed to, if they wanted to go out and go fishing, they had what they needed and I love it. I love, I just love doing it. I love helping kids. There you go, good fish, good fish. Well, the Lake Fork Sportsman Association, they give us money that we give to our boat captains, traveling fees, and they're one of our sponsors and they've helped us out tremendously. Everyone in the community is well aware of them. There's a lot of uh, individual, private citizens that are members. The Lake Fork Sportsman Association is a role model I hope will encourage other groups to become more involved. It's a great example of volunteer leadership. There are eyes and ears out there for the anglers, and so we couldn't have a better partner in helping to manage and steward this world-class fishery for Texas. For all that they've done for us and for what they've done to Lake Fork, it's a big help. It makes me feel really good because they're the reason that we get to fish. Out here in the mountains of West Texas, you'll find a rare animal. Desert bighorn sheep, at one time completely disappeared from this region. Historically, the native Texas desert bighorn sheep occurred in about 16 mountain ranges out here in, in the Trans-Pecos, mainly due to uh, unregulated hunting, diseases associated with the introduction of domestic sheep and goats, and net wire fencing. Uh, they brought the demise of, of the desert bighorn, and by the early 1960s, they, they were gone. They were all gone from Texas. Come on, bighorn. Okay. But the bighorn has made a comeback. Recent restoration efforts have brought a healthy bighorn population back to its native home. One key factor for the survival of the restored bighorn population is access to water. Water is scarce in these arid mountains. 
but there is a way to ensure the bighorn has enough to drink with a man-made watering hole called a guzzler. A guzzler is essentially a rainwater collection system for wildlife. We've got two large panels of sheet metal that collect the rainwater, funnel that down into storage tanks that feed two wildlife-friendly watering stations. These watering stations play a big role in bighorn sheep restoration, and they also provide for any thirsty critter that comes along. But it's no easy task getting a guzzler going. Uh, safety things on the bird. We do want you to duck a little bit. So all you tall guys got to be careful because you're tall and... and you won't be. Yeah, don't ever raise your hand. <laughs> hey, see you later. <laughs> on this spring weekend, the Texas Bighorn Society has gathered at Black Gap Wildlife Management Area for a work project. These work projects normally last a couple of days and they are always in extremely remote areas. For this work project, we've had over 100 people here to help us build two water catchment devices we call guzzlers. Black Gap weren't already remote enough, the workers must travel by helicopter to the mountaintops where the guzzlers will be constructed. We use helicopters to ferry all the equipment we need to get up there and build the guzzlers high enough up to be utilized by the bighorn sheep. tanks anchored down, the troughs in place. I think all we have left to do now is put tin on, run our fast line to our troughs and plumb everything in. That looks good. Uh, it's a hands-on organization. I brought uh, my son and his friend so they could see what real conservation is. And we've been doing it a couple of years now. And he's a junior in high school, and he'll be able to take this as a lifetime event for him. Now we need to get over there and proceed. By the end of the day, this team has completed their mission, leaving behind their mark on this mountain. And after a scenic ride back to camp, they're rewarded with a well-earned feast among friends. Are you, are you in the way? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Before the weekend is done, the group is already collecting funds for the next effort. I got 200. Can I have two and a half? Two and a half. I got three. I got three. Three, three, three. I need three. I have 306 U.S. dollars right over here. Yay. This land is suitable for all the game that live here. It was missing one thing, water, and now it'll have water. That's conservation right there. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. State Park and Historic Site is a really special place. We have a really nice blend of history as well as natural resources. The park has camping, places to go hiking, biking, canoeing, paddling, as well as the uh, history which it's mostly known for. Probably around five or six o'clock, church bell rings again. Everyone went back to church one more time. That was, again, completely different for the Native Americans. A whole new experience. This is a 18th century Spanish mission, one of the first efforts by Europeans to colonize Texas. Besides being introduced to Catholicism, the Natives were introduced to all different types of Spanish living. 
that wall is original as well, all the way around. When the mission was at its peak, there were about 300 people living here, and those were mainly natives uh, housed within these walls. The missions at Goliad lasted 81 years, closing in 1830. The buildings eventually fell into disrepair, and much of the wood and stone from the site was salvaged by local residents. The property was acquired by the state in 1931, and a year later, the first of many restoration efforts were begun. We have the historic Mission Espiritu Santo de Zuniga, uh, dating back to 1749. We have Mission Rosario, which is about four miles outside of downtown Goliad. This was the bell tower. Rosario would have been very similar to what you see here at Espiritu Santo. It was never quite as successful. But when they did an excavation here, what they found was a lot of little pieces of painted plaster. The mission compound was never developed to the extent that this was. And so when you visit there, you're only going to see the ruins of the mission buildings. You'll see the outlines of all the different rooms that were there. It's uh, really quite interesting to go visit Rosario and, and see the similarities and the differences between the, the activities at both sites. Goliad is also the birthplace of General Ignacio Zaragoza. Born at the nearby community of La Bahia in 1829, Zaragoza led the Mexican army in the Battle of Puebla. On May 5, 1862, General Zaragoza's outnumbered forces defeated the occupying French army, a date now celebrated as Cinco de Mayo. Many of our visitors come here specifically to see Mission Espiritu Santo. And then they stumble upon the fact that we have beautiful campgrounds in our park and a lot of nature. These are called our Eastern Lubber Grasshoppers, Spanish Dagger. This is called the Anakwa tree. We have beautiful nature trails where our park rangers will do guided tours on the weekend. It's a hog nose. He's smashing himself out and, and making himself wider to look bigger right now. You should never try this, okay, because I'm a professional park ranger. I know what I'm doing. We do have a beautiful biking trail called the Angel of Goliad Hike and Bike Trail. It connects downtown Goliad, which is historic in itself. It goes all the way through the park and then connects to Presidio La Bahia just down the road from us. There you go. Got it. And we have the San Antonio River Trail. It's a real natural, undeveloped trail. It's great to be able to see the river. One of the other special things we have is we're on the Goliad Paddling Trail, which is located on the San Antonio River. It's about 6.1 miles of uh, beautiful, pristine river. The river has always been one of the main draws of this part of Goliad. There's a lot of evidence that it was inhabited by native groups well before any of the Europeans had arrived here. And so when the Spaniards came to this area, they recognized it as a good place to build the mission as well. You really get a good sense of the history here because we have so much of the site intact. Here you have the entire perimeter wall. You have a more or less uh, natural landscape surrounding the mission. So you really get a good sense of what it would have been like to live and work here all those years. I think the thing I love the most about this park is it is a small, peaceful park. We have a little bit of everything here. We have the San Antonio River, the beautiful mission of Spiritu Santo, the campgrounds that are just gorgeous, lots of wildlife. It's just a blend of everything that you don't find at other parks. It's a lot of fun.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.